I can't tell you how many people told me, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Like, <laughs> it's not a friendly industry. There's a lot of risk. The likelihood of success or even just just starting, just like taking your first baby steps or, you know, like when a little bird takes off from the nest and just <laughs> tries to fly, they're like, there's a chance you just crash hard. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. Today, I have my second repeat guest, a very exciting episode. For some reason, everybody loved this episode more than the other ones. It was my best buddy, Nick. His company is El Mago Cigars. He's the only person I've interviewed that owns a cigar company. And the story behind it and the journey he's been on is pretty damn cool. So I'll let him kind of get into it. We'll talk about what he did, how he built it, where it came from. I'm really excited. We've got some Ed Mago cigars that we're going to be smoking. You guys don't usually see me smoking on the podcast, but I figured this was a special occasion. So we got some whiskey, we got some cigars, and we've got a great guest. Thank you for having me back, buddy. Without further ado, let's light these cigars. Let's light these cigars. Go ahead, do the, do the honors. Do the honors. Tell them while we're doing this what cigar we're smoking. <clears throat> So, yeah, so the company that I own is called El Mago Cigars, E-L-M-A-G-O. Uh, in English, that means, translates to wizard or magician. I started this company in uh, September of 2021 and uh, spent about a year building the company, building the brand image, um, kind of uh, mixing the packaging of my cigars with the story behind it which we can get into later and producing the uh blends the the which is basically the each unique cigar the the tobacco inside of it um <clears throat> and we uh we make our cigars out of nicaragua um and uh and yeah and so what we're smoking right now is the miami maduro which for those of you who probably Probably many of you aren't familiar with tobacco, but uh, the wrapper on the cigar is a Maduro wrapper, which usually uh, is an indication of more strength in a cigar. And this one in particular is from Mexico. Uh, San Andres is the region. And, um, the, and then the, the filler, the tobacco on the inside, uh, is from Nicaragua. So that's what we got going on. Beautiful. Well... The best part about cigars is they smoke for a while. Mm -hmm. We've got a long conversation ahead of us. I will put my life savings that Nick will be double as far down with the cigar than I am by the end of it. <laughs> um, so Nick kind of mentioned there right off the bat that he kind of dove into the cigar industry a little over a year ago. We had him on the show. He was guest number four. Uh, actually, he might have been guest number three. Um, a lot has changed since the last time we talked. Last time we talked, you had, I think, only three blends at the time that were out. Mm -hmm. It was the Yellow Tubes, it was the Miami Maduro, and then it was the Art Deco ones. Yep. Now we've got a, a lot larger of a palette to work with here. Eight. Eight cigars we have now. Eight with eight with three on the way. Three on the way. Three on the way. Yep. So like, what what do a t what is a typical big cigar house? How many blends do they typically roll out? So for the for the big for the big cigar companies that have been in the industry for oh here you got yeah, let me get the bottom you got it yeah touch it up Andres Andres knows what he's doing with cigars I'm not I'm not that much of a rookie just to just to explain what Andres is doing he's trying to he's trying to get the whole the whole area to um, be like this like grayish ash color because you don't want any part of it to be um, black because that just shows that that part is not burning and then your cigar will burn unevenly no so, canoes out here for you smokers can no canoes canoes is when half the cigar burns and the other half doesn't and it looks like a canoe so um but back to your back to your question big cigar brands that have and and some of the biggest brands they've been around for over 50 60 years um and they have like almost like a catalog of products, just page and page and page. Some of them have over a thousand SKUs, you know, between their accessories such as lighters, cutters, and, and ashtrays and all the different cigars they offer and the different various forms of packaging they offer. So, um, yeah, so a lot of them have a lot, like hundreds of different blends, different individual um, 
you know, cigars with different tobacco inside of it that they've made. Um, but then others keep it more simple and they come out with one, one new cigar every couple years, maybe. Um, so the fact that it's been like, like a year and a half uh, of selling and we've worked our way up from th from one initial blend to three, then to six, then to eight and soon to 11. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're moving, we're yeah. moving, we're trying to, we're, you know, because for example, uh, we're smoking a Maduro. Mm -hmm. Some new smokers, they might not want something that is stronger. They might, they might want something more mild. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to cover all of our bases so we can share our products with everybody. That's awesome. And explain the different types of blends, because I know you just mentioned Maduro is typically a darker blend, something that a newer smoker might not want to grab. What are the other types of cigars they might see in shops? So the three most common um, I think pretty much across the globe is the Connecticut wrapper, um, which is from Connecticut, from the U.S. It's typically lighter, right? Right. It's typically it's typically a more uh, like a caramel colored wrapper kind of, um, and that one is associated with being the most mild. And then in the middle, you have the Habano wrapper, which is um, it's like a brown color, like a little lighter brown than this, and that's pretty much considered medium. And then you have the Maduro, which is this one that's a little darker. Um, some companies, for marketing purposes, they unnaturally treat the wrappers. So sometimes they brew them and they make the wrappers in, insanely dark, like as dark as our mics. Um, and uh, that is supposed to be the Maduro. Obviously, this is a this is a natural. This is not treated, so it's not as dark as some other ones, but it's the same. Uh, leaf. It's the same wrapper. And then you have different wrappers. Um, like, for example, we have a blend out that is a Cameroon wrapper, which originated in Africa, that looks like the Habano, but the, the flavor on it is, is very different. And so getting into the industry, I learned that there's hundreds of different types of combinations of tobacco you can use between the wrapper, the binder, which is the wrapper's outside, the binder's on the inside of the wrapper, and then the filler, which is right in the middle. So that's basically what a blend is. That's A blend is made up of those three components, and it's just different combinations and percentages of certain leaves based on their order growing out of the ground from bottom to top, and it affects their taste because of their exposure to sunlight. So I learned all this, and I'm still learning, uh, you know, every day about blending and... Um, and then another uh, last wrapper I'll mention is what we have coming out next. We have the Solstice coming out next, which is a Sumatra wrapper, which has a similar similar shade to this wrapper, um, but a very different flavor profile. All so. right. Well, I'm looking forward to trying those. I think I've tried every single one other than the Pepe because mm -hmm. that one was a little dark. I feel like it scared me off, <laughs> um, but I'm working my way up to it. We're going to get into the questions, the most asked questions from the last. Let me see the Pepe. We got our beautiful, uh, I'm going to call him our set designer, Mirko, in the background here. Here's the Pepe that I have, and it's a box press. It's a purple wrapper. It's my favorite wrapper, like label, um, wrapper, label that you have on the cigar, uh -huh. and it is a box press. So I'm, I'm working my way up to this one. And so the funny thing about that is, just to touch on my point about blending, that's the same wrapper as this one. But it's a lot stronger. And the reason why it's a lot stronger is because of what we put on the inside of the cigar. So just like the saying is you can't judge a book by its cover, same same with cigars. You know, just because you see the shade of the wrapper on the outside, it doesn't mean that the cigar is necessarily going to be overpower overpowering and too strong or too mild because what's on the inside matters too. There it is. See, that's a beautiful <laughs> statement. The two most asked questions from our last episode was, describe how to start a cigar company and then the other one was the classic what's the difference between a cigar and a cigarette which we're going to get both of those answered but before that talk about the origination of the brand where did the brand come from what's the story behind it because people will come to find out this is not just your average cigar company it has a very unique and amazing story behind it so yeah for those who who um didn't see our our first episode um 
the the story behind the brand it was back in 2021 when i got the idea to start the cigar company and so i started it in honor of my grandparents who you know my my grandfather was from cuba and my grandmother was from czechoslovakia and my grandfather when i was 16 years old he introduced me to cigars and i smoked my very first cigar with him um and you know he had been smoking for his whole life and so i you know i I took a, a love and a passion for cigars because I would smoke with him. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we're fast forwarding now um, to, to 2021. Um, there was a, a building that collapsed in, in Surfside, Florida here. And uh, unfortunately, my grandparents were, were in the building and passed away in the collapse. And so I wanted to make something to honor them and commemorate them. And obviously cigars, popped into my head immediately because I when we were together with my grandparents having lunch or when I would visit my grandfather at work he was smoking a cigar his car smelled like cigars you know so I thought of cigars and I, I made a glorified arts and crafts project for my mom um, it was a box of 10 cigars with their picture on it and she encouraged me uh, to start a company around it so I can share their story with everyone and so I came up with El Mago and I chose that name for the first two letters of my grandparents' names. So M-A for Maria, G-O for Gonzalo. And on the band, which might be hard to see here, but it's an actual picture of my grandparents back in Cuba. And then behind it is the James Hotel, which is a hotel my grandfather bought in 1989 um, and still is, is owned by my family today. Uh, I... I superimposed that in the background and that was my inspiration for a lot of the colors of the designs um and i have fond memories of seeing him smoking cigars in the lobby of that hotel um so that's the reason why i put that there and uh on on my box which we don't have my box unfortunately yeah. but i i show their passport stamps which is a big part of their backstory it shows their journey to freedom here in america and it goes from Cuba to Czechoslovakia, Canada, Venezuela, and Miami. So that was their that was their journey to make it here. So I kind of just connected all the all those uh, design features, I guess, which um, tell their story on my packaging, and uh, it took me almost a year to kind of put put all those thoughts together on on a physical box, on a tube, on a band, and then and then we launched the company. Yeah, and I'll make sure the sponsors of this episode, Micromedia, do a great job of putting the image of the box that we're talking about so you guys can see all the details. I have This is a unique episode for me, just like it was the first time. Nick is somebody that I can call a best friend since we were five years old, and now we're both 25, still together. Um, so I'm very familiar with his family, his grandparents, his grandpa and grandma were amazing. His grandpa was one of the most unique people I've ever met in my life. And I remember being with you as we were, as you were like, hey, I, I want to make this for my mom. I think it'll be like an amazing Christmas gift. And then you sent over the video of your mom's reaction to the gift. And then you were like, I'm going to actually like do this. And like fast forward to now, it's really like a holy shit moment. Like to think that you have all of these blends you're going to PCA. You have all of these massive accomplishments now. You you have you're in hundreds of shops around the US. Like it really is surreal to think like what this passion project, arts and crafts project turned into one blend, three blends, six blends, eleven blends. Yeah. It it really is amazing. And what was it like to I mean, you you knew about cigars, but what was it like to be like fuck it, I'm going to start an actual cigar company, not just be a cigar connoisseur? Well, it was very, it was very unique because it's not easy to find something that you're incredibly passionate about in life, like especially when it comes to work because, you know, at the end of the day, like let's take school, for example. A lot of people go to school because Oh, you need you need a job at the end of the day. You love school. <laughs> I hated school. <laughs> um, but yeah, you need you need a job at the end of the day. You need to put you know you need to pay your bills, put food on the table, all that. And so, 
a lot of jobs are, are, are jobs. And it was unique for me to find such a, a, such a thing that I was insanely passionate about. And like, I was super driven. Like I just put my head down and bulldoze through whatever was in my way. And, you know, in the cigar industry, there's a lot of barriers to entry, especially being 22, which is how old I was when I started it. And I'm, I'm 25 now. And I can't tell you how many people told me, Hey, are you sure you want to do this? Like, <laughs> is not a friendly industry. There's a lot of risk. The likelihood of success or even just just starting, just like taking your first baby steps or, you know, like when a little bird takes off from the nest and just <laughs> tries to fly, they're like, there's a chance you just crash hard. And I was like, I don't care. I was like, I want to do this and I'm going to do this. And so that's pretty much exactly what I did is I didn't care about what the potential negatives were, or the potential failures were, I didn't care. I knew if, if it was not going to work out, I put my best into it and I would be happy with, with just that. Um, but it ended up working out and I started off by going around Miami myself, going store to store. And I was just telling cigars myself. Um, I would bring my products cause I wanted everyone to see the packaging so I could explain the story with the box. And everyone knows in the cigar industry that Miami is the hardest market in the U.S. And why is that? And the reason for that is because all of the big, the big names, a lot of them actually live here. And if they don't live in Miami, they live really close by, like within two hours away. And a lot of them even have their own like factories down here where they're not growing tobacco down here, but they're, it's like a, it's like an extension of their factory in Nicaragua or Dominican Republic or Honduras. They have it here in Miami. So with everyone being here, uh, it's very competitive. And a lot of the store owners kind of have the attitude like, who the fuck are you? Because they know all the, all the big names. Yeah. So you really have to be persistent, which I was. And you have to really prove yourself uh, in every way, shape, and form, in every angle, which... I knew I, I knew I had, you know, the, the story of my grandparents life and journey is, is second to none. And all I, all I hoped to do when I started the company was make a packaging that was able to, you know, at least tell their story somewhat decently. Cause I know I can't match up to what their journey, what they did in life. So I just wanted to do my best. So I got their story. And I wanted the packaging to, I wanted it to shine. And just like the James Hotel that stands out, which inspired the Miami Vice Colors actually, uh, my packaging, it, it, it does shine, it yeah. does stand out. And then the third thing, which is in the, in the industry itself, business wise is probably almost more important than the first two things is having a fantastic cigar, having fantastic blends that people will uh, come back to because you could have the story. It could be eye catching, but if they don't like the cigar, that's it. You're done. Yep. So I partnered with Miguel Pinto, uh, who's been in the industry. Like I would call him a veteran in the industry for over 30 years. Uh, I was able to buy in, uh, to the factory in Nicaragua in Esteli with him. And that's where we created some, some truly amazing blends that just really hit the markets hard and, and people loved it. And, now, fast forward, we're in over 30 states, over 150 different uh, cigar shops, lounges, and bars. And uh, and you mentioned PCA. We're going to PCA in like one month. Explain so. what PCA is and the significance of that. So PCA is it stands for Premium Cigar Association. It's the biggest cigar trade show of the year. Um, you know, it's... You kind of, it's not really like something that you can just go to if you own a cigar company. Like you have to sort of qualify. They have to like, they check your socials, they check your website and all that. So you have to be at, legit in their eyes. It's kind of like invite only. Right. And then of course you pay an arm and a leg to go. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's going to be exciting because retailers from all around the world, um, you know, it's mainly targeted in the U.S., but a lot of retailers go and that's where they kind of get their get their scoop get their news on the industry because it's a it's a it's a more um 
old fashioned industry that's a in person right now a lot of things are on the phone technology and all that so the the news the rumors all that is you get that in person so so people like to go there to see what's what and so it's a big deal that we're that we're going after not even two years of sales Dude, that, it, it's amazing and i remember we've talked about pca throughout this time of just like that's the mecca of cigars i wonder when it's going to be your time to go and have a booth and do everything and i'd be lying if i said i thought it would be this fast and it's it's a Me huge, too. it's a huge accomplishment and shout out to Miguel. I know Miguel. He's an amazing guy. I remember when Nick was trying to decide where, like, where you wanted to, to make your cigars. And Miguel owns Cigar Cigar. Shout out to Miguel and Leo. Um, shout out. That's our local cigar shop. And they really, really, Miguel took Nick under his wing, took you under his wing, and gave you the lay of the land. And you had mentioned earlier how it's a tough industry. And I remember us talking and being like, damn, I wonder what these people are going to think about this 22-year-old walking into their shop, telling them to spend a couple thousand dollars on cigars he made. And look, we're, we're here now. And I want to dive into the packaging because I think that was like a really pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. You decided not to be boring and not to be the rest of the industry with black, wood, red. You really went out and like, did the Art Deco Miami, Miami Vice colors. You have a yellow cigar, a green cigar, a purple cigar, an orange cigar, mm -hmm. a red cigar. It's like, and I remember being like, shit, this is kind of like a risky move, I feel like. What if people don't <laughs> like these colors? What if it's like different? But it goes back to your point. It hit, people liked it. But you actually put a quality cigar behind this best of breed packaging, which created that, yeah, it's, I'm not going to say it's easy, but you can get people to grab a new stick off the shelf and try it. The challenge is getting them to want to come back and not buy their other blends that they used to smoke, their bigger brands that they used to smoke. And I think your success is a, a, a testament to the fact that you really did put out a quality product. Mm -hmm. You went out and put out a cigar that rivals any of these other big brands. And your customers are the ones that are showing you that with direct feedback of the fact that you're able to sell 11 blends get invited to PCA. Let, let's go to the first question that people ask. Give somebody listening a, a pitch on what it's like to start a cigar company from the ground up. We talked about what you did, the few things you learned, but if someone's listening right now and they're like, well, I want to start a cigar company, what do they need to do to be successful? So to start a cigar company, there's a few things that just need, they have to be checked off in the beginning you need to get your manufacturers in line. So you need a manufacturer to make your cigars. And I would say it can't be any manufacturer. Like, so like if you look at the clothing industry, sometimes you can get away with a manufacturer who has access to, you know, the cheap materials that is in a lot of clothes now and like, okay, that could work. You can get by, but you can't get by with tobacco. You can because it's, it's, a, it's like a, it's a commodity. And it's, it's a living, it's a living organism and it, it requires a lot of care. Like it takes over a year to make a single cigar. So you need to have a trustworthy manufacturer that really knows what they're doing, knows how to handle the crop, knows how to age it, you know, to, to perfection. Um, and you know, won't, won't, uh, won't do you dirty because a lot of, a lot of people that know about the tobacco industry, they know that a lot of people don't know about the tobacco industry. So they know that they can skimp yeah, and, and you know, they can give you something that is uh, an inferior product. So you need someone that's trustworthy to make your cigars. And that's, that's step one. That's, that's gotta be step one. And then step two, you need a manufacturer that can reliably make you the, the packaging that you want. And being in the, in, in the industry for, hasn't been so long, but yeah. for this amount of time, I've seen a lot of people that they're trying to start a cigar company and they get led in the wrong direction where let's say they have the cigars check, but then they're going to do the boxes because a lot of it, it's not like an all in one, like done for yeah. you, you know, it's like the cigars are here, the boxes are here, boom, this is, so you got a, a lot of moving parts and if they get the cigars right, maybe the boxes come out wrong. Uh, you know, so it's, it requires a lot of homework, honestly, to get that in place. It's really cigars, packaging, 
and then um, that's not even the hardest part. Yeah. That's just the bare minimum. The hardest part is the distribution. Yep. So you need to, you got to, it's a lot of footwork. You got to have your boots on the ground. You got to go shop to shop. You got to get someone to believe in you and believe in your product. You got to, it's, it's, it's illegal, but um, you got to give out samples, which, you know, I've never done because oh. it's illegal, but you have to give out samples um, and you have to get your product in people's hands so they can trust you because they might trust what you're saying, but they need to trust your product. Yep. So it takes that kind of relationship building, I guess. And then people will hopefully start putting in orders and then their customers now need to relay positive feedback to the owners so you can keep that cycle going. And um, a lot of that, aside from the quality of the product and the story and how you present yourself, it could also be done through price point because, um, you know, it's a lot of people that smoke cigars are like blue collar people, believe it or not. A lot of people think it's like a, like, like you have to be like multimillionaire yeah. to be a, you know, smoke a cigar there, but it's a lot of blue collar guys that are going every day and they enjoy their, their cigar time, their downtime with it. So, um, you know, price point helps. Uh, and then you got to know the market. You got to know your competition. Like when I was starting, I would, I would sit in the humidor and thank God I was at Cigar Cigar and I knew Leo and Miguel because if not, they would think I'm stealing. Yeah. I would stand in the humidor and walk around for 20 minutes and I would look at everything around. And that's how I got the idea to come out with colorful boxes because the humidor is made of wood. Usually, usually it's like a cedar because it holds in the humidity well. And then the boxes are made out of wood, which is also usually like a cedar or a pine wood. And so you have wood on wood. And I thought, you know, making something with a lot of color, something that pops, it would really just bring this humidor to life. And I used to call it, I'm renovating humidors. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so it's, so that's the bare minimum to start. The distribution is, is, is the next step. And then the third step is just expanding the distribution, which is the step that I'm on right now. I remember those days of walking through those humidors and you had only one cigar at the time. And it was like, man, if you really just continued to make cigars like this with bright colors, you would renovate the humidors. And it's, I think of it like there's probably plenty of people that listen to this that watch Shark Tank. You think about when those food companies come, it's like, ah, oh, shit, you want to go to retail or the toy companies? You got to fight for shelf space. Like you got to fight for some shelf space. How important is that in a humidor? Because for someone that hasn't been in a humidor, you could be off in the bottom right corner, hidden away behind 30 boxes of your competitors, or you could be smack in the middle or in the front of the humidors. What is it like to, there's one, one step is getting the store to buy it and have it. The other step is getting the store to believe in your in your your product to right. put it up in the front for their customers to buy. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, that's the other challenge is there is limited. Just like a grocery store, there's limited space available, and whatever sells the most is going to get put in the the spotlight, the the hot spot. Um, and it's then it's extra competitive because your big brands that have been around for a while that everyone knows the names of they actually require most stores to, you need a light? Yeah. They actually require most stores to buy as many as 30 plus different, different facings, different types of cigars to get the rare one. Or, uh. or they require them to buy that many just to open the account for them, just to like, just to like get them started. Yeah. So they already, you know, that's 30, that's 32 boxes on, on a shelf. So that's already taken up in, that's a, insane. in, in a, in your average human or that's already taken up like a third of it almost. So, so it really, it really is like a, so, <laughs> like, like a fight, I guess out there. Um, so how did, how did you go out and, and beat some of these big brands? Because we walk into plenty of humidors and like, I always make it a point no matter where I'm at, if I'm traveling, if I'm in Miami, I'll go into any cigar shop I see and I'll just ask, hey, you guys have Edmago cigars? That's my favorite cigar. No matter what. I love doing it. To the, There's a kiosk in the Miami International Airport. If you're ever at the Miami International Airport, you probably are because that's where most connecting flights. There's a little kiosk in there. 
Go ask them if they have Edmago cigars. They've seen my face like 15 times, <laughs> and they still don't have them in there. Uh, but how, how did you go and compete and get that top shelf space when really you are a quote-unquote boutique brand compared to some of these behemoths? So when I, when I was started, boots on the ground, like I was telling you, I didn't actually realize all this that I'm telling you. Like I didn't, I didn't actually realize how competitive the, the, the landscape really is. I just, honestly, I just wanted to share my story and, um, I was willing to do, you know, whatever it took to share the story and, um, get a cigar in, in someone's hands. And so I, I just, I think, it, I think it's due to the, like the power of my grandparents, you know, how, how amazing their story is that I just had such good fortune and though it wasn't easy in the beginning, a lot of stores they told me like look they kind of took the approach like look you're a, you're a nice kid i've never like i've never seen someone this young even walk into this fucking place <laughs> they're like i'll give you a shot and they they thought that the packaging was cool everyone thought the packaging was cool they they appreciated the story most of them some of them cut me off and just <laughs> wanted the prices um but once the cigar got in there it did its thing and it sold. And so from there, their tone changed from, hey, uh, hey, look, I'll do you this favor and I'll help you out. It changed to, dude, you did an amazing job with this and the cigar sells. I don't even have to be a salesman. It just sells itself. So that was happening pretty much, pretty much like everywhere we put the cigars. And then now I'll tell you about expanding distribution. Uh, I met this guy, Jeff Groover, and he's a, he's like another veteran in the industry, very well-known sales rep who sells some of the more prestigious brands, uh, a select few cause he's particular with what he likes, but very prestigious. And he saw my product from the beginning. I was like, holy shit, this is, this is cool. But I just wasn't big enough. Yep. I didn't have, I didn't have enough blends out. And so he said, Hey, I'm watching you, but, uh, you know, I'm watching you. I don't want to do anything yet together, but let's keep in touch. And then fast forward to when I had six blends, he actually, he told me, he goes, I was in butt fuck Florida. That's what he said. <laughs> I was in butt fuck Florida. And I walk into the store and I see your cigars smacking me in the face, looking at me on the counter. And he goes, what the fuck am I doing, man? He goes, it's time. So I was able to get enough uh, accounts is what I call them, enough accounts in a concentrated area to where he knew that I went out and I, I did the work and that people believed in me and that I had, you know, I had legs under me. And then he gave me a call and said, Hey, man, can I, can, can I join the team? I'd love to represent your brand. And so that's where we are now. I've got Jeff, covering Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi for me. And then I just signed on with the oldest uh, cigar brokerage firm in, in the US, which is the Polar Brothers, started by their grandfather, passed down to their father. Now it's two brothers that are out of Houston, Texas, and they cover eight states. So that's how the expansion is working now. And, you know, really it, it took, uh, number one, it took me like believing in myself and my product and my story and getting it out there. And then two, you got to have other people believe in you because you can never do anything on your own. You yeah. got to have a team for everything. And so, and I had Jeff believe in me. Everyone respects the shit out of Jeff in places where I'd get no respect. Jeff gets all the respect in the world. And from there, the, the Polars, you know, got wind of, of what Jeff was doing and then they were interested. And so, boom, we signed on and now we have this, this team here and we're bringing the team to PCA going to go meet the rest of the of the country and hopefully looking to expand our team by one to two more reps in different areas and that's keeping the wheel turning that's that's how it's going how significant is it to sign one of these distributors because you and i know how significant but explain to somebody how adding one of these people is like overnight changing the trajectory of your business yeah so uh like i was explaining before that the cigar industry is like more old-fashioned and in person uh, in order to, to, 
it's one thing to get into an account and have the product do well for a few months or whatever, even a year. But then to maintain the account, usually the owners, they expect a certain level of respect, which is, which involves a human being walking into the door and saying, Hey, I am representing El Mago. They've had a previous relationship most of the time. And they say, Hey, what do you need? I want you to be fully stocked. So, so you can make the sales you need. Tell me what you need. We'll bring it in. We'll get it moving. And that's kind of the, uh, the standard in the industry. That's how, that's how cigar lounge, cigar bar owners expect to be treated. So that's why sales reps, brokers, whatever, you know, whatever you call them are so important. Um, because they, they really, uh, they, they, they give your, a brand legs because yeah. I can't clone myself. I can't be in multiple places at once. So they're an extension of me. They tell my story, they represent the brand and they're, they are, uh, extremely important and they're like family, honestly, because they, you know, it's not only that they're, it's only that they're, they're, they're getting sales in places where I can't be it's that they're telling my grandparents story in places where I can't be, you know, and they're showing my packaging. And so it, it means, it means a lot. And it's, it's very hard to, uh, partner with these guys. Cause they, they usually go for like the top dogs. And I can tell you that Jeff and the polar brothers, they've built brands that are now doing several hundred millions of dollars a year in revenue. So, you know, they're, they're big time. They're, they're big time. It's crazy. And it's funny, the amount of times you and I have had a conversation, I have a background more on online and doing things online. It was so hard for me to understand like really how important it was to be boot selling. I was always coming to Nick saying, dude, you got to run this. You got to do this. You could try and have this VA call all these shops and set this up and this up. And I just kept getting the same answer. Yo, it's got to be boots on the ground. It's got to be boots on the ground. And now that you've gone out and hired these people and actually brought what we talked about into real life, I've seen how it's the, what you ordered a hundred thousand cigars last year from Miguel. Yeah. Well, in the first, in the first calendar year of sales, um, which almost all of the year was like by myself with no sales reps. We, we broke the hundred thousand mark of, of cigars. So that was a big, that was, that was a big, that was a big tell that, that the brand's going in the right direction. And then what would you say, like, now that you've added these sales reps, what percentage more in sales are you doing now? 20% more than you think you did last year, 50% more than you think you did in your first calendar year. Um, maybe that's a tough. Like, yeah, I put a number on. Yeah, it's. I mean, I I would. We're early in the year, but I would I would uh, est if I was estimating, it would be like probably anywhere from like six to eight times more sales than in uh, than in all of 2023. So six to eight times more in 2024. It's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> six to eight times more than a hundred thousand cigars is a, a much larger number. I'm not a mathematician, but one another question that people continuously asked from our last episode was explain the creation of a cigar. I know there's that 200 hands touch every cigar that comes out. What is the process of building a cigar look like? Give somebody a inside view into what it's like to actually create one of these. So cigar is a, is a plant. It's a, it's a leaf. It's a leaf that grows out of a, out of a seed that grows out of the ground. So obviously the first step is to plant the seed and the, the seed matters because the seed represents the, the species of plant, you know, the, the type of tobacco you're growing. Um, and then once the plant grows out of the ground, which, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of tobacco plants that have like good soil, like the type of soil that's in Nicaragua. They can grow to like six feet tall, even more in some cases. And so then you have to pick the leaves off the plant. Uh, like I said before, there's an order of leaves from top to bottom. Each leaf has like a, a function. Each leaf has a, a different uh, taste to it. 
like there's a there's a leaf for example for example second from the bottom called seco uh and that leaf is pretty much mainly uh the main purpose of that leaf is to keep the cigar burning so if you have a cigar that like it's one thing if you put your cigar on for a while and it goes out and you have to relight it like that's one thing but if you have a cigar that is going out on you quickly yeah you know there's a problem with your seco you don't have enough and sometimes a cigar will burn like really unevenly you have too much seco in that area and seco is dry mm -hmm. so that's why it, it combusts easier um but get your, your order of leaves on the plant and then you pick them out and you put them in a bunch and probably some of some of the viewers i've seen they they get wrapped in a, in a bunch of leaves and they get hung from the top of a barn and the barn is kind of uh closed off because it needs to be hot because the leaves they will actually sweat and so the leaves are watered so they it's like a it's like a steam room or like a sauna and they sweat out ammonia which ammonia is very bitter and obviously you don't want that in a cigar you don't want bitterness in a cigar um so once you have that the leaves go from green to a brownish color and then you put them in what's called a pilon which is uh, a giant mound a giant pile of of leaves uh could be a, a giant pilon can be over like ten thousand pounds in some cases usually they're under that but you put that also in a hot room so let them sweat a little more and then you have to flip them over one by one they flip them over to the other side and so that so that that's a very crucial process because you need to age the leaves properly so you have a cigar that is uh, enjoyable and if you rush if you rush the process, you're going to have a bitter cigar. Like you're going to have this like bad taste in your mouth. Um, and so, you know, what, what makes some of the best cigars is simply time, letting them rest for the right amount of time. And so once the leaves are ready to go uh, and they've been properly aged, then you, you, you sort out the leaves. So you sort wrapper binder filler and, then that's when you start messing around with the blends. You create the blends and you combine different types of tobacco and you roll the cigar. And once you once you roll a cigar, usually you, you don't put the wrapper on, you put the binder and the filler and you put it in a mold to shape it like a circle to get it more defined. And then you put the wrapper on after that. And then there's different molds too, because there's like, for example, like the Pepe that we have, it's a box press cigar, it's a square shape. There's different molds. And these molds are, it's like a, imagine like a hydraulic press, but yeah. without the hydraulics, it's a spring and you twist and it presses down and you leave the cigar one side for 24 hours in this mold. And then you flip it 24 hours more and it creates the shape of the cigar and it stays that way. And then you have to age the cigar more once it's rolled. So the tobacco dries out uh, because smoking a, wet cigar uh it's, it's it's not a good taste so the tobacco needs to dry out it needs to lose humidity actually and then once it's once that has happened which you know usually it's a little over two months probably um then you import it right we import it and and then we sell it and then when people buy it it's funny they put it back in a humidor um because that's just that's the way it works so the cigar needs to get the water out and then people can store it in their humidors and smoke it and enjoy it. And typically a cigar won't go, won't go bad. It won't go bad as long as you have it in the right humidity and it doesn't dry out. Cause if it gets too dry, the wrapper will crack, but keep how, it. How long will it last if you keep it properly stored in a humidor? I mean, there are cigars that are from like the 1950s, 1960s that are still ready to smoke. It's kind of like wine. Like if you keep it, well stored it ages and it's actually a better product or is it kind of an acquired taste like i know there's like yeah. that steak what's the steak that's like a 30 day aged and it has like a funky flavor and mm -hmm. some people love it I, I think it's disgusting i'm not comparing it to that <laughs> steak but is <laughs> there's like the does the quality of the cigar go up like if i gave you a cigar that's been in my humidor for eight years versus you giving me a cigar that you've had in the humidor for eight weeks, is that looked at as like a more quality, like nicer cigar? There's like a debate on that. Okay. And so 
I think I think uh, like a rule of thumb what a lot of people that have a lot of experience in industry say is a cigar is good if you keep it in the right humidity, the right temperature, uh, eight years aging it, it'll be good. And then there's a the flavor the the flavor profile it changes and it could change drastically the longer you age a cigar. So some people say that if you age a cigar longer than eight years, it could change for the worst. Um, but there's people that would say, you know, oh man, I smoked this 25 year old cigar and it was the best thing ever. You know, it's everyone has a different palate, different taste, but I have heard that like eight years is kind of like, all right, smoke that shit, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Get it out of there. Yeah. So when you talked about the creation of the cigar, is there a lot of machines or is it a lot of hand manual labor? There's, uh, huh. there's like, no machines, pretty much. There's a machine called a draw master, which uh, is something that's used for quality control. But in most in most factories, there's there's no machinery really. Uh, there's I mean there's there's tools which yeah. you know don't require any electricity or anything like that. Man, like manually movable kind of yes, machines. Yes, yes. Uh, like <laughs> like what people now would consider Stone Age <laughs> stuff. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's all done by hand. This is. And that's why I love this in, this industry and I love cigars because it's it's one of the last products that is fully made by hand. There are some companies that, that roll cigars with a machine. They have a machine that rolls it. Um, but even these machines are like, they were built in like the 1920s. Yeah. And, uh, but for the most part, um, and all of our cigars are hand rolled. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's all done by hand. And sometimes, you know, Maybe you'd use a scale to weigh. Yeah. Uh, that you know that that could be about it. But a lot of times it's like we won't dock you for the scale. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 It's what one one use of measurement. And is that where that quote that sits on your boxes came from? Hand made to hand held. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I love that quote. Absolutely. And I got I got a lot of inspiration to make that quote when I went to Nicaragua. And you just see everything. It's literally everything's hands on, hands on, no machines. Uh, everyone has uh, their their um, like it's like an it's like an assembly line for cigars. So you know, there's people who take the the veins out of the wrappers and spread the wrappers out nice to get ready to be put on the cigar. There's people who do the do the bunching. There's people who are 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 doing the initial roll of the cigar, which is the binder and filler, and then even down to the uh, the band on the cigar. The bands are put on by hand and the glue, which is not a, it's not glue. It's a, it's a plant extract. Uh, they, they use it to, to put the, to put the wrapper on and, and kind of, you know, seal it. It's an, it's like an adhesive. Um, but everything, everything, absolutely everything is done by hand. And it's very impressive to see how like, they're like surgical. They're so good with it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's impressive. What was it like going to Nicaragua for your first time and seeing the actual people making your product from start to finish and being able to like witness what that process looked like? So here in America, we have Amazon Prime. <laughs> you order something and it shows up to your house the same day, the next day, two days later. It's like, all right, all right we got it. It's like instant gratification and, and you, you kind of, you get a little desensitized to appreciating what you have. But when I went to Nicaragua and you see the process and you see what it takes to make this, it's like, it takes perfection to make a cigar. And so it really truly makes you appreciate a cigar. And when you smoke it, it's like, you have a, you have a different, um, different respect for cigar smoking because when you when you see what it really took to make one it's like it, it changes the game so you have the question that i think is like the most popularly googled question about cigars what's the difference between a cigar and a cigarette Oof. well i have to ask all the viewers what's the difference between a toyota camry and a ferrari so the difference between a cigar and a cigarette, uh, 
main difference. Obviously, they both create smoke. I know that's why people like com like combine the two. It's not even close. Uh, a cigarette has what is it? it has like almost 300 chemicals in it something something like that and it is a very small amount of actual tobacco and it's uh cheaper tobacco typically um because that's not the that's not the focus of a cigarette it's not the it's not the tobacco you know it's got all the other chemicals and stuff going on um whereas a cigar is strictly tobacco the wrapper's tobacco as a tobacco leaf, the binder, tobacco leaf, and the filler on the inside, tobacco leaf. It's just pure tobacco. There's no chemicals in it. Um, and then the other big difference is a cigarette. It, you inhale it. So, you know, that's why typically a cigarette is uh, addicting to a lot of people because the nicotine absorption when you inhale is uh, kind of immediate. Whereas a cigar, you can you can try, but you won't you won't be able to inhale a cigar. You'll you'll throw up. Um, Unless you're Max Crosby from the Raiders, yeah, toasted a cigar on an, in, in the ESPN interview. Yeah, that's I don't, <laughs> that's that's, different. that's that's crazy. Um, and uh, so yeah, all tobacco, and you don't uh, inhale a cigar. You just beer. Mm and blow it out. So you just hold it in your mouth and you blow it out. So you don't get, um, you don't get the, like the, 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 the rush or the, or the, or the buzz as, as quickly, or sometimes you don't even get that, that rush at all as like if you were to vape or, or smoke a cigarette. So the cigars in a, in a league, in a league of its own in that sense. And, um, I don't, I believe that nobody has ever gotten like lung cancer or something like that from a cigar just because you don't inhale it. Um, so it's a, I believe it's the cleanest form of smoking that exists. And, um, I think it's the oldest form of smoking that exists too. It was used in a lot of, um, like, ri like rituals back then, spiritual outings type of things. And so, um, it's got a lot of rich history behind it. What are your thoughts about flavored cigars? Is that fraudulent? Is, are the, is there such thing as a quality flavored cigar? Uh, I would say the answer is yes, um, because fun fact, I'm pretty sure it's still this way. The number one sold cigar, which if we're counting non-flavored and flavored cigars in the same category, that's what I'm talking about. The number one sold cigar is a flavored cigar. And I think it's, I think it's just because, uh, I think for the same reason that most people won't drink their alcohol straight up, they want a cocktail, they want it to be mixed. I think it's kind of the same thing with cigars. Um, it's a big debate though, because a lot of people that are like true cigar smokers, they think that flavored cigars are complete bullshit and they would never touch one. Um, but there's a lot of people who they're not as big of uh, what you consider your traditional cigar smokers and they like flavored cigars more. Um, so, you know, that's, a. Uh, it's almost like, it's just like two different so categories. Like completely different. Yeah. It's like, I would, I wouldn't, I would actually never put them in the same category. You say it kind of sits in between a cigarette and a traditional cigar or like just completely its own category of smoking. It depends. It depends, uh, who the manufacturer is like, I think some manufacturers make efforts to make their flavored cigars more natural and not containing chemicals. Um, but then there's some that they have chemicals in them. So yeah, I would guess that one would be a little closer to a cigarette. Whereas a traditional cigar, it's all tobacco. So that's a, that's a, that's a big debate, but flavored cigars make up a big, uh, portion of the, overall cigar industry so for that reason they have to be uh legitimate you know they have yeah. to be um something that a someone getting into cigars i guess would would consider so are cuban cigars what they were before and how many of the cuban cigars people are smoking are fake so i can tell you that 
most of the Cuban cigars are fake. And a lot of people in the industry, and I, I guess I don't really have a way to verify this, but a lot of people in the industry say that the fake Cuban cigar market is bigger than the real Cuban cigar market. That's just, that's just how big it is out there, how many knockoffs are being produced. And no, unfortunately, Cuban cigars are not what they used to be. Um, just a, I guess a personal piece of evidence I have of this is uh, my, my friend who owns a cigar lounge in Kuwait. And so Kuwait, they can get real Cubans, yep. like here we can't. Um, he says that, he tells his customers this. He says, expect if you buy a box of Cuban cigars that you will not be able to smoke half of them. He says, expect to throw half of them out either because the vein was not taken out and there's a giant vein in the middle of the cigar that's called a plug, which you won't be able to draw smoke from that. Or it's just, it's too wet. Um, or there's a problem with the weight. There's skimping on the cigar and it just, it'll, it'll burn pretty terribly or it'll be just like way too bitter because they did not age the cigar enough or they didn't age it at all they just rolled it and 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 shipped it off wet um but you can you can still find good cuban cigars they are out there they're just a lot harder to find than they used to be and they come at a price that's now probably uh, now the price is probably three times higher than it was five six years ago for a cuban cigar so Jeez. i mean you're looking you're looking to pay like at least like probably 40 bucks for your average cuban cigar whereas you could buy a fantastic properly aged Nicaraguan Dominican Honduran cigar um, for like, you know, anywhere from 20 bucks and under that just will smoke way better. I'll take my 10 to $15 El Mago over, over the Cuban. There you go. What's your favorite drink to enjoy with a cigar? So overall, my favorite drink is coffee. And I know, I know you were you were guessing that that's what it was going to be, but it's not just any type of coffee; it's the El Mago coffee, is what ah, I ah okay, yes. it's the El Mago coffee. So the El Mago coffee, I had I've had an addition in the last six months to the El Mago coffee concoction. We have I like to do americano; that's my that's my style, and I put like six drops of vanilla extract. I put a slice of butter. And I pour the coffee over, I let the butter melt, I mix it up. And then when the coffee cools down a little bit, I either do one of two things, depending on how I'm feeling, if I'm feeling crazy, I'll put some maple syrup in the coffee as my sweetener. And then most of the time I'll put honey. Okay. So I love to have that with a cigar. Um, obviously when you think of coffee, you think of having it in the morning. So it goes fantastically with like a Connecticut um, and then what I'm drinking now, a little bit of uh, whiskey, and that goes well with a medium to full body cigar. So I like that. My drink of choice is tequila, though, and I haven't found a fantastic pairing with tequila. So maybe if somebody has one, they can recommend it in the comments and please. steer Nick in the right direction. Please, please. So... At the tail end of this conversation here, we've talked about your whole journey from start to finish, and I think it's fitting to end it with you explaining where we're in, where we're filming this right now. If you were to see the room, you would you would maybe chuckle a little bit at at, at the room and and the state that it's in. But where are we at right now, and what's coming? We are at the demolition center. <laughs> um, so we're in the new El Mago office slash distribution center slash warehouse we can call it um slash retail center uh so recently in the last in the last month uh, myself and my my mentor miguel pinto business partner in the factory uh, we moved into this space um we have we had five office spaces now we have three office spaces and a giant humidor because to the right of Andres, we just went to town with a sledgehammer and knocked down this wall. We're gonna build a giant humidor to house all of the El Mago cigars. Um, and we're gonna fulfill our orders out of here and ship across the, across the country. Um, and 
internationally coming soon. Um, and this is where we are. Yeah, if you guys if you guys could see the rest of the place, you'd be <laughs> like, all right, you got a little bit of work to go. But no, things move very fast in Miami. We are one week away from, from starting up. Just because there's half a wall on the floor in the next room doesn't mean we're far away. Doesn't mean we're not one week away from opening this bad boy up. That's right. Well, dude, I, it's, it's all these things that we talked about at the beginning have all started to come true. And I think this is the real stamp. We always talked about how cool it's funny. I say we like me and Mirko and a couple of us just really mooching off you, hoping that you would get a cool space like this so that we could have a spot <laughs> to hang out, have a spot to smoke inside, play poker. And we finally got what we wanted we and it's it. close to the house. It's beautiful. It was like you did it for us, I think is really what it was. I mean, you got <laughs> you honest to God, you know, I would be I would be upset with myself if I wasn't able to to do something cool like this because I think we all deserve a nice little spot to hang out with because you guys were very involved and very much part of, of this brand launching and you guys helped me out a lot. So this is gonna be this is gonna be our headquarters. I love that. A lot of time we'll be spending here. Well, dude, thank you again for coming on the show. I know this was short notice. It's and I had this one in my back pocket. The people really wanted part two. But I know how people, sometimes it's hard to get people on a schedule. And I knew I needed to have you in my back pocket as like this episode could happen at any moment because you're not the typical guest. So I was happy that we were able to make it work. And then I'm happy that people are getting to see what has come in the last year. Because I think we filmed the last episode close to 10 months ago, maybe even 11 months ago. So we're almost a year out. And man, th things have really changed. And I'm happy we got to document it. And I think the cool part of having this podcast is I'll continue to document your journey as we go. Maybe a year from now, again, we'll get back on. Or maybe even six months if you do some crazy in the next six months, sales go crazy, you go to PCA, sign. Or if I go streaking in a football game. Dude, some guy, uh, that could be you. It could be a great ad. It could be me. could be you. <laughs> um, so, and it's funny. Most of the times at this point in the interview, I give my guests a gift and it's an El Mago cigar box, but I'm not going to give you your own box as a gift. So you just got to suck it up. You get no gift. We're filming at 1045 at night. So, man, thank you again for coming on the show. This has been really exciting. It's a story that I'm very familiar with, but I know people listening are really going to dive into and enjoy. And again, Go to your local cigar shops, ask for Edmago cigars. If they don't have them, DM Nick on Instagram. All of his stuff will be linked below and put him in contact with the store and then you'll get Edmago's in your area. But where, and the last thing is, where can people find you? Where are you? You're, you're all on Instagram, right? Instagram and Facebook, just at Elmago Cigars, one word. Um, and then our website, www.elmagocigars.com. Um, our products are sold in various places online as well. Um, Two Guys Cigars in New Hampshire, uh, Smoke Inn in South Florida, still considered South Florida, Neptune Cigars, and a few others. And if you go to our website, we have uh, we have a uh, locations tab where you can kind of see where we're located. We're in the process of updating it right now. We're going to have everything updated very shortly, and you'll be able to see where you can find the cigars. Amazing. And again, like I said, all of Nick's stuff is going to be linked in the description below. For you lazy people that can't even click down and look at the description, he said it out loud. You can do your due diligence and find it. But if not, you can click it in the description. And again, thank you for coming on the show, buddy. You got it. Hey, part three. Part three. Everyone's got to tune in part three where this place will be renovated. Renovated. Well, Done. maybe we'll do a I'm trying to make my own personal YouTube. Maybe we'll do the first video of uh, Ed Mago factory tour. Yeah. 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 There we go. And we could even do a before and after where we can see how ugly it is and then how pretty it is. Let's do it. <laughs> all right, man. Well, this has been another amazing episode. Thank you all for tuning in. Do me the favor. It's not that hard. Please just like and subscribe to the damn video so I could keep booking cool people. And thank you all for being part of this journey. We've grown a lot since the last time we had Nick on the show. I think we're at like 400 more subscribers than we were, 400 more followers on other platforms. And we're just going to continue to plug away and interview amazing individuals like Nick. Keep, keep subscribing so my buddy doesn't have to start an OnlyFans. Please, 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 seriously.